I've grown over 2,000 different species of plants from seeds. Everything from house plants like cactus to perennials, trees, shrubs, bulbs, you name it, I've germinated them. Over the years, I've developed a foolproof method for germinating seeds, both easy germinators and really difficult germinators. And in this video, I'm going to share my secrets with you. If you watch the video right to the end, you'll understand my methods and you'll be able to germinate all the seeds you want. Tonight we're going to talk about starting seeds, but we're pretty much going to ignore vegetables and we're going to be looking at some of the more difficult seeds. We're going to start with collecting seed, which may seem a little odd for a program like this. But as we go through this, I think you'll learn some things about seeds that will then help you when we go and germinate. So when are seed ready? Well, traditionally, this is what you're told. They're either dark brown or black, they're dry, and they're easily released from the seed pod. They're now a separate entity, and that's the time to collect. This is true for maybe 80% of the seed, but it's not always true, and we'll look at some examples where it doesn't work. Uh, this is Allium Christophii, which is a beautiful allium. It makes a really large head. All the alliums make nice seed in that it sits on the plant for a long time, so you don't have to rush collecting it. It's nice and black. You know when it's ready. You see these little heads, and there's three or four seeds in each one. And when it looks like that, eh, you collect it, and you just really grab a handful and clean them up and away you go. Good seed usually is roundish, it's plumpish. And a lot of times when you go and collect seed, it, it will look kind of flat or squished or wrinkled. That's generally not good seed. This is important because as you get more experienced in growing things, you're probably going to start getting seed that comes from, let's call it less than reliable sources. So there are lots of seed exchanges that you can get involved in. You can order all kinds of weird stuff there. But this comes from other growers. And a lot of times these growers actually don't know how to collect the seed. There's one particular plant that uh, we've been getting seed for years from and it never germinates. And we finally realized that the seed is just not viable. You get these tiny little black things, but they're, they're not really developed seeds. I think this is a bachelor button plant. Uh, you can see the seed head here. And one of the things you might notice is that some of them are green and some of them are starting to get brown. And not all the seed heads on a plant are ready at the same time. So this collection process happens over a number of weeks and even months on certain types of plants. If we grab one of these, this looks pretty green still. I mean, it's sort of a yellowy green, but it doesn't look very brown. But if you open it up, the seeds are ready. They're loose, they're black, they're nice and round. You don't have to wait until seed heads are brown. As you're collecting seed, you kind of have to get to know each plant. Everyone's going to be a little different. And in this particular case, you can pick the pods when they're quite green and still get viable seeds. Now, if I had opened this up and those seeds were a light color, either a white or a light green, then they're not ready yet. You do have to wait until the seeds are ready. Uh, this is a hosta plant. And the pods here are quite green. And you would think that these aren't ready. But in fact, if you open them up, the seeds are ready. They're fully developed. Again, they meet our definition. They're, they're black. They've separated from the pod. There's time to harvest these things. Now, one of the reasons I like to include this picture is that you get a variation of these seeds. You have some of these large black ones, which the right-hand black arrow is pointing to. And then you have some of these smaller ones. The large ones are properly developed seeds and they will germinate. The ones on the left are not developed properly. They will never produce a plant. If you see these small things, just, just get rid of them. They're not worth saving. Again, this is a plant you can harvest the pods green and the seeds may be ready. The only way to know for sure is to open them up and have a look at those seeds. Another thing that happens quite a lot with flowers is that the flowers themselves open and develop at different times. And a lot of plants, particularly if they have a central spike, will open the lower flowers first and then over several weeks 
move up that stem as more and more flowers open. And if you have that situation, well, the seeds develop that way too. So in this case, uh, I photographed it kind of sideways, but the left-hand side has the lower part of the stem, and those seeds look pretty ready. And the ones on the right, which is the upper part, uh, those pods are still green. So I can collect a few of these pods, but the rest I have to wait till later in the season. Now, there are flowers that flower the opposite way. They'll still open up at the top and first, and then slowly the lower ones will open. This is a neat looking little seed head, and this is a clematis seed. Uh, you get these seeds, which are there in the bottom part here, and then you get these hairy tails on them. And I'm not really sure why they're there, uh, except they probably help with distributing this plant in the wind so they may get caught and fly around. Uh, for a long time everybody said these tails on these seeds have to be removed, that the tails interfere with germination. And so all the people would go and get these seeds and break the tails off. And it's a bit of a tedious process. But several of us now have done a number of tests with these clematis and they germinate just as well with or without the tails. Now, this is a beautiful garden plant if you ever have a chance to grow it. It's the gas plant. You see this nice pink coloration on the plant. It's very strong as far as the fragrance goes. It's sort of a lemony fragrance. The uh, butterflies just love this plant. And this is the seed head. They're starting to get ripe, but they're, they're still in the green stage. When this plant is ready to give up its seeds, the pod actually will open up and looks more like this. This plant's kind of neat because it actually shoots the seeds out. So the arrow here is pointing to one of the seeds that's still in the pod. But once it gets to this stage, if you touch this pod at all, it has a trigger mechanism in there and it just shoots the seed right out. This is one of these plants where you have to harvest a little earlier. You shouldn't wait this long because there's a good chance you won't get any of the seeds. So you come along once the pod's sort of brownish and you collect them so you don't lose them. Another good way to collect these is with these what we call organza bags. And you can get these at the dollar store. They're sold for holding jewelry and they're used as weddings to give out little gifts and things. And you get different sizes of them. And what we do is once the seed heads develop, we just put this around it. Now I don't have to worry about collecting these seeds. And again, this is one of these plants where the seed uh, isn't ripe and isn't ripe and you go in day after day, it isn't ripe. And then one day you go out and it's overripe and it's fallen off the plant. It's very hard to find. But if you do it this way, you don't have to worry about it. You just come on later in the summer, cut the stem off, and you can see here the seeds are nice and black. The seed pods form these little pipes. They're, they're really interesting. So this is a great way to collect them. So anything in the garden that I want to collect and, and I'm afraid of losing, I'll do this. I also do it on seed heads that I know the animals will eat. So a lot of the berries, for instance, you know, the squirrels will come along and eat those before they're ripe. If I put one of these organza bags over them, they leave them alone and then I can harvest the seed. So we've talked about getting these seeds. Now, how do we clean them? bunch of different sieves are handy and you just put them in there and you shake them and get rid of most of the chaff. Here's a way that works really well. This is an old bread pan, a really old bread pan. And I just put the seeds in there and then I take it outside and I literally blow at it. Most of the time the chaff is lighter than the seeds. The seeds tend to stay in the pan and the chaff will blow out. Now it it does take a little bit of technique so you don't blow the seeds out too, particularly if they're smaller. Uh, but it's not hard to do and it, it actually gives you some very clean seeds very fast. Uh, I've also used this a lot. This is, a, I think, a butter dish. I got it years ago. It's plastic and it's very smooth and it has these curved edges. So anything like that will work just as well. So here's a mixture of seeds and stems and, and little seed pods. And you, you just take this and you shake it and then turn it up so that one side is higher than the other side and the seed tends to be round and rolls to the bottom of the tray. And then you get rid of the chaff and then you tip it the other way. And again, the seeds roll to the end and you get rid of some chaff. If you do that a couple times, you've got pretty good clean seed. 
Now, it's not absolutely critical that you get every last piece of this out. In fact, I've sewn it just like this, and, and it's fine. But a lot of that chaff now is dead organic matter. And if you're sowing these in a pot, that tends to get fungus on it. And we don't want our little seedlings to have fungus around them. Best to get rid of most of this organic material. Another problem we have with seeds, the fruit that's around the seed. So these are tomato seeds. So I've gotten rid of the tomato and I've taken the seeds out and each seed is covered in this gelatinous material. If you go online and ask the question, well, what should I do with these seeds? How should I harvest them and how should I clean them? You'll get a bunch of different answers and of course everyone thinks that they're right. And in fact, there's three different ways to clean these. And I'm going to show you the three. And what I did one year is I tried all three methods and then I tried germinating all three methods to see how they compared. I wanted to know which was the best method. So this is the simple method. You just take those and you put them on a paper towel and do nothing. The gelatinous material dries up and you get these seeds. They're covered in this material, which in theory inhibits germination. So many fruits stop germination. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. The argument against this method is that this won't work because the seeds won't germinate. They're covered in this uh, goop from the tomato. Another way to do it is to take those seeds and before they dry, just rub them on the paper towel so that they're fairly clean. So we've now got rid of the gelatinous material and we just leave them on a paper towel to dry and we harvest them. And then this is the method that most people recommend. So you take the tomato seed and you put it in some water in a dish and you just leave it sitting open in your kitchen. And after about four or five days, that thing will be covered in mold. It will be bubbling because of all the bacterial action taking place in there. And the microbes basically clean the seed. The microbes won't damage the seed, but they'll eat all the gelatinous material. And then when you put this through a sieve and wash it, you get these really nice clean seeds. Well, which way works best? Well, it turns out they all work. This last one gives you really clean seeds. But it's a lot of work and you have this smelly tomato stuff sitting in your kitchen for a week. I generally use the middle method because it's a little bit of work and gives me some cleaner seeds. But all three of these methods work. And yet on the internet, you know, there's a group that believes you have to ferment these tomato seeds or they won't be any good at all. When you're doing germination of seeds, you have to understand that a lot of the information that's available is, is not true. A lot of the questions you might have about seeds, a particular type of seed, nobody knows the answer to. Okay, this is a, a part of science where we really need to do a whole lot more work before we understand it. Now, in general, fruit does inhibit germination. So it's always a good idea to take that fruit off. And so here's some different uh, types of seed. These are mostly shrubs that make berries. And so I've cleaned them up. And what I tend to do is I... I mash them up with some water, I get most of the fruit off, and then I just put them on a plate like this to dry. Now we've got some good seed, or maybe we've got seed from somewhere else. So we've purchased some seed, or we've joined some group to get some seed. Oh, by the way, it's springtime, so one a great way to get seed now is the seed exchanges. Almost every city now, has, at least in Ontario, has a spring seed exchange. It's takes place on, usually on a weekend. People bring in free seed and you're able to take free seed back. There's a big exchange table and you just throw your seed on and take some and so on. It's a great way to get unusual plants. But I'll show you some other ways to get seed in a minute. So how do we store these seed? Again, lots of information about this, but most people miss one of the most important things. And it's because they don't know this here. When we take seed, it, they fall into sort of two camps. About 80% of the seed out there is orthodox. It's called orthodox because they're normal. They're what we expect. So it's a standard seed. They like to dry out. Once they're dry, they can be stored for a fairly long period of time. Well, there's this other group, which is about 20% of the seeds available. They're called recalcitrant seeds. And the definition of that word is having an obstinately uncooperative 
attitude. They just don't do what we expect them to do. Most of those will die when you dry them out. Our common advice is go out and collect the seed, dry it up, and then store it in, say, a, the fridge. Well, that's really bad advice here because that will kill 20% of those seeds. We have to know whether our seed is orthodox or a recalcitrant so we know how to store it. So I have a friend who runs a company called Seed, and a lot of this is North American and Ontario native seed, also some from Europe, a lot of rock garden plants. So if you want the really weird stuff, uh, hers is a good place to go. And this is a picture of uh, some trillium seed. Trillium seed is one of these recalcitrant seeds. If it dries out, you'll find that the germination rate goes way down. Trillium seed is much better kept moist. And in fact, we want to collect this quite early. So this seed pod is showing seeds that are brown and they will get darker, but we don't want to wait that long. We want to collect these early. And in fact, even these are too old already. We're now learning that if we collect these seeds when they're young and green, they germinate much better. And this is actually true of quite a few seeds. When seeds are developing, there's a point at which they germinate very easily. And that could be before the mother plant actually releases them, before they're brown. Or it could be several weeks or even months after the plant releases them. And it has to do with the way the seed's developing themselves. So trillium is one of these that we want to plant early. We don't want to dry them out. Here's some more seeds. If you dry them out, they'll start dying off. And lots of these are Ontario natives. In fact, I think all of them are. All of these seeds don't like to dry out. In fact, what my friend usually says is these are DOD seeds. If you dry them out, they're dead. So what she does is she takes the seed, collects them from the field, and then puts them in with a bit of vermiculite and a little bit of moisture. You can just see a few droplets in here. So they're not sitting in water, but they're quite moist. And then she stores them this way. And in fact, she packages them this way and she ships them this way. If you don't do this, they die very quickly. So if you take these seeds, the ones that were shown on the last picture there, and dry them out in three months, they're pretty much dead. So where should you store these? I see lots of people telling you to store them in freezers. And the reason for that is if you go to a professional seed bank, Okay, so these are one of these government organizations that store seeds, you know, for a hundred years. They freeze everything, but they do something that's very important. They make sure the seed is perfectly dry. So they go through a drying process and they actually test that seed to make sure it's dry. And once it's fully dry, you can freeze them. But if that seed is partially dry and it gets frozen, it can kill some of the seed. So I recommend never storing them in the freezer. Put them in the fridge if you want to store them. In fact, if you're collecting seed from last fall and you're planning to plant it this spring, you don't even have to do that. Just leave them laying around on your desk. Remember, some of this seed, when it's ready to be collected, it's not yet mature. It may still take a month or two to mature. It's just sitting there. It's not doing anything as far as you can see. But inside the seed, it's still developing and still maturing. So if you're not looking for long-term storage, just leave them at room temperature. If you want to store them for more than six months, use the fridge. And use paper or these little glassine envelopes that don't seal very well. Don't use plastic. We want these seeds to dry over a period of time. You have to know which one it is. So if it's one that should stay wet, it should be in plastic and moisture should be in there. But assuming the seed is a dry type, you want that seed to slowly dry over time. And so you want to put it into paper or some container that allows the moisture to escape. Uh, these envelopes work quite well or just regular paper works well too. So if we look at the seed, we can kind of divide it into two groups here. We have the easy germinators, and then we have hard germinators. And if you're new to this whole thing, I strongly recommend you pick easy germinators. And in fact, when I think back quite a few years ago when I started germinating a lot of seeds, what I would do is I would get this seed catalog, and I would actually pick the things that were easy to germinate. And by easy germinators, I mean it doesn't take too long to germinate. Uh, you can do it at room temperature. 
you don't need any kind of special treatment, and your success rate is pretty high. So the rate of germination is quite high. Those are all easy germinators. Okay, all the vegetables are easy germinators. So if you're really new to this, uh, vegetables are a good place to start. But so are many of the other garden plants in our, that we have. A lot of our perennials are easy to do. A lot of our annuals are easy. Perennials you kind of have to know about. So there are difficult perennials and there are easy perennials, but many of them are quite easy. So start with those germinators. You'll have great success. And when I did that, I would germinate probably 90 to 95 percent of the ones I tried. A lot of my seed was coming from other growers, and so the quality was not always great. So you always expect some duds in that package. So then I started getting bored, and then I decided, well, now let's go to the more difficult germinator. And my percentage rate went down. So now I'm at about 75%. So if I just pick a bunch of random perennials out of a catalog that I don't really know much about, but they're difficult germinators, then I'll get about 75% will work and the other 25% won't. And what are difficult germinators? Well, as some general categories, we can list them like this. Most native perennials, and by native here, I'm talking about Ontario native. Uh, for some reason, they seem to be tricky plants. Most trees and shrubs are difficult to do. Many rock garden plants are difficult to do. There's a bunch of perennials that are more difficult. Now when I say difficult, it doesn't mean you won't have success with them. What it means is that you may have to do some things to get them to germinate. And that's what a large part of this program is all about. What is it that I do to these seeds to actually make them germinate? Well, to understand that, we start with seed development. What's actually going on in this seed? And I think there are a couple surprising facts that many people probably know, but they haven't really thought about it. The first one is that seeds are alive. They, they're just sitting there and they don't look like they're alive, but these are living entities. They're breathing. They're taking sugars and mixing them with oxygen and producing CO2, just like you and I right now, we respire. That's where we get our energy from. There are chemical reactions taking place in that seed. Even though it's been sitting there for three to 10 years, that seed is still alive and metabolically active. The chemistry in it has slowed way, way down, but it's still alive. It's still doing things. It's also important to understand the process of these seeds. Put this little list together and we start at the top. So we have pollination taking place that develops the seed. And that seed goes through a process which usually takes two to three months where it matures. And it goes from a very tiny embryo that's just been fertilized to that black round thing that we collect. That's the maturation process. Now in this slide, it kind of shows it as an endpoint, but in fact, it's, it's, it, the endpoint is a bit squishy. It, it happens over a period of time. And that black seed is not necessarily a fully mature seed, but it's around the right time period. At that point, we have a finished seed and it goes into a state of dormancy. So all seed is dormant. If we take it and just put it on a desk, it's not going to do anything. I don't know of any seed that will germinate that way. It's a dormant seed, but it's alive. Now it goes through a process of germination. And the germination point is when the root or the radical actually comes out of the seed. That's a bit surprising for a lot of people because a lot of people grow these seeds in soil. And so what they do is they cover the seed with soil and they wait until the little green tip comes up. And they call that germination. My seed has germinated. That's not right. The germination takes place when the root comes out. So if we take something simple like a tomato plant, you probably see the green leaf two days after the seed actually germinated. So that's almost at the same time. Two days, not that big a deal. But there are other seed where that time period between root and first leaf can be a year. Trilliums can germinate and make a root and be underground for almost a year before you see a leaf. Germination is when the root comes out. And then, of course, once the root comes out, then the shoot develops and leaves develop, the plant grows and eventually it becomes a mature plant. We're going to really look at this dormancy stage, the time from collection to germination, because we're all about how do I get that root out of the seed?
Well, let's think about this seed and uh, it's sitting here in nature and most seed is developed, you know, in the summertime it gets pollinated and it sort of matures in the fall. And so now we, we go into winter, it's sitting on the ground. Let's say the seed all germinates in the fall. What happened? It would come up and it'd be tiny little plants and suddenly it would snow, it gets cold and it would kill everything off. And so plants say, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want to die here. So I'm going to build in an inherent dormancy. I'm going to create my baby seeds in such a way that they do not germinate in fall. They're going to wait till the fall and spring. Because if they germinate in spring, they now have spring and summer and fall to develop into a larger, stronger plant. And now it's ready for winter and it can survive that winter period. Dormancy is a natural process that many plants use to protect their seed so it doesn't germinate in fall. Now again, everything I'm going to tell you about seeds are exceptions and some seed will germinate in the fall and, and they just suffer the winter and they're able to get through it. But many seed won't. Many seed will wait till spring. So what is dormancy? It's a mechanism that prevents the seed from germinating. It's built into the seed. It's part of the genetics to tell the seed, don't germinate. Just lay there until spring. Now, we don't always want to wait till spring. We want to speed up these processes. So we're really trying to find ways to overcome dormancy, even though the seed doesn't want to. Here's what happens when the seed comes out of dormancy. We're not actually going to look at this slide, but what this represents is some of the chemical processes that are going on inside a seed from the time it starts its germination process to the time it actually germinates. The takeaway here is it's a complicated process. This is not simple. We go from little brown black thing to root and leaf and it looks so simple, but on a chemistry basis, it's complex. And to be honest with you, for most seed, we have no idea what that process is. There are different types of dormancy, and we'll have a look at a couple of these. The number one thing that keeps seeds from germinating is water. I can't think of any seed that germinates without water. So that is a state of dormancy. And so one of the first things it needs is that water. And that's true, let's say, simple seed like all our vegetables. As soon as we put them in the moist soil, they pick up moisture from the soil around them. They usually swell and that water triggers that previous slide. It triggers all of these chemical reactions that take place until a root comes out. Some seeds develop a hard seed coat you know, may not want to germinate walnuts, but we have lots of seed that has a hard shell on it, particularly trees. Why would a plant do this? If you think about it from a plant's perspective, I'm going to make, you know, hundreds or thousands of seeds. I don't want them all germinating at the same time. I mean, if they all germinate at the same time and, and the weather goes really bad, it gets really cold, or maybe we have a drought, they all die. So for me, it's much better if I create seed that are going to germinate over many years. There's a better chance for me to end up having seedlings, for getting my genes into new plants. And so that's one of the reasons a lot of seeds have seed coat. And in fact, every seed has a seed coat. It's just on, on many seeds, it's, it's fairly thin and on walnuts, it's, it's very hard. But we do have a process to overcome that. And we actually uh, nick the seeds and it's called scarification. Uh, this one I mentioned already. Uh, most fruit has chemical inhibitors. So the fruit itself contains a chemical that stops the seed from germinating. So if this fruit drops to the ground, it just sits there. Until the fruit is gone, the seed won't germinate. And one of the things that happens with a lot of these seeds is birds will come along and eat them. Their digestive juices digest the fruit. It cleans the seed. They poop out the seed and now the chemical inhibitor is gone. So the bird is cleaning those seeds in nature. Or they just sit on the ground and bacteria come along and over a year or two it slowly decomposes that fruit. And again, we have clean seed and it's ready for germination. A lot of seed has undeveloped embryos. Now I've used a peanut seed here just because the pieces and the inside stuff is nice and large and you can see it. But this embryo is not undeveloped. So if we look at this, we have something called the seed coat. That's the outside, the shell of the seed. 
The cotyledons are the first leaves that you'll see on a lot of plants. And the cotyledons are already partially developed. Those are the two halves of the peanut. And then between the two, we have this thing in here, which is the embryo. And if we looked real close to the microscope, you'd already start seeing little shoots and leaves and stems and roots and everything are already there, ready to go. This is a, a large embryo. But in some seed, that thing is, is very, very small and completely undeveloped. And so that seed just needs time to develop. So even though it's absorbed some water and you think, okay, you should germinate now. You know, you've got your water. You should be over the dormancy. It says, well, okay, I still have to develop here. And I may sit here for another month or two as my embryo gets large enough to actually make a root. Some seed requires light and dark. Uh, many seeds don't care, but some are quite fussy. In fact, most seed wants light. There are a few examples of seed that have to be dark to germinate. Uh, but most seed, what they want to do is they want to come to the surface of the soil, they get a bit of light, and then they germinate. And you may be familiar with weed seeds, right? We have this seed bank. Our soil is full of seeds, and if they're deeper down, it's too dark, they don't germinate. But when you come along and disturb the soil, they get moved to the surface, they now get the light, and they germinate. These seeds are dormant until they get that light. This white thing on here is an elasomere. It's protein, and the seed makes this to attract ants and other insects mostly. So this is a trillium seed, and the ants will come along and before you do and harvest this thing, take it into their nest, they eat the protein, they throw away the seed, and guess what? The trillium seed germinates underground, so it's using the ants to get it around. It also is a good reason why you have to pick your trilliums early because you've got to be ahead of the ants. Another thing that's really important for getting over dormancy is temperature. Seed might require warm temperatures or cold temperatures or cycling between the two, warm and cold and back and forth to germinate properly. And temperature is one of the most useful things that we use to get things to germinate. This, by the way, is a peony seedling, and we're going to talk about that at the end of the program. So how do you know which dormancy a seed has? More importantly, you know, how do we get over this? Quite honestly, the only way you know is either experience or you look it up. Here's a couple places for you to look it up. Now, this source is from my website called GardenFundamentals.com, and there's a menu option called Free Gardening Books. This is a, a series of three books done by Dr. Dino. Uh, many years ago, he went out and collected seed from all over the world, and he tested the seed. He tried it warm, he tried it cold, he tried it with different moisture levels and so on. This book summarizes what he found, and it was really the first time scientists actually looked at a lot of these seeds. That's a free book, you can download it from the site. It's a pretty good resource. It may be the best resource there ever was until we went electronic. The other place that I go, and this site has a lot of Dr. Dino's information in it, and that's the Ontario Rock Garden and Hardy Plant Society. You don't have to be a member to use this, and it's the germination guide. So that's that menu item right in the middle here, and the page is open. It's a germination guide instructions. Pretty easy to use, and we're going to use this in a couple minutes and look up some information. This is the best online source for germination information. If I have new seed, I always go here first, and I would say 95% of the information there is correct. And even when it's incorrect, it's close. The other thing they do is they do a seed exchange. And so the next menu over there is called SeedX. Just missed it now, although you might still be able to access some of those seeds. But if you're a member, every December you'll get a list of some 2,000 different species of plants. And you can order 60 seeds from them. And it costs you next to nothing. You're basically paying your membership and some postage. That's how I got a lot of my weird stuff. Uh, there's a similar organization in the U.S., the North American Rock Garden Society. They have an even larger list of plants. The nice thing about this one, the Ontario Rock Garden, is they also do other things. So some trees and perennials and so on, whereas the American group is just rock gardens. And there's other groups around the world. So if you're interested in weird things that you can't buy anywhere, find one of these groups. And that's where you get the seed. Let's go and germinate some things. So we're going to germinate some petunia seed. And I used to germinate a lot of these. Let's say I have a package 
I don't know how to germinate petunias. I will go to the Ontario Rock Garden Society and look it up. The list is by botanical names. If you type in petunia, you almost find it, but you do have to know what the botanical name is. And two of them came up on the list, and this is taken right from their website as of this morning, actually. We don't know which hybrid we have. We're just, you know, it's just the garden variety petunia, so we'll go with hybrid here. And it says, so at 20 degrees centigrade, seed germinates in three months. What this tells me is this is an easy germinator. Now it says three months, but it never says anything less than that. Even if you looked up peas here, it'll say three months probably. Sort of their minimum time period. So what this says is it germinates reasonably quickly and 20 degrees is room temperature. Okay, we don't have to have 20 degrees. We have to be somewhere in that ballpark. So room temperature is great. And I basically germinate things at two different temperatures, room temperature and in the fridge. There are a few seeds that need to go outside and get frozen, but uh, most of them are just room and fridge. So if I had this seed, I'll germinate it at room temperature. From what I remember, petunias aren't fast germinators, but they germinate in sort of a week to two weeks. They're quite small seed. They won't take three months. Easy germinator, no problem. Well, let's look at something a little more complicated. How do you germinate peonies? In fact, this is a picture of one of my rocky eye plants that I grew from seed. And on the left is one of my seed pods. So the first thing we notice about this seed pod is it seems to have two kinds of seeds. It's got these large bluish black seeds and it's got a whole bunch of these red seeds. The red seeds are not properly developed seeds. I don't know if they haven't been fertilized or they were fertilized and weren't developed, but whatever it is, they will not germinate. They're basically junk. And when you collect them, you only want the black guys. And they're pretty large seeds. You can dry them out if you want. Peonies are actually pretty easy to germinate, but it takes patience. So let's have a closer look at this. Back to my website. Well, what does it say? Well, the first thing you find is that there's two pages of different kinds of peonies. Peonia is the, the genus name for peonies. And we have one here, uh, tenuifolia. You might recognize as the fern leaf peony. Vicii I've germinated. I've done this one down here. Woodwardii I've done. But in this case, we have a rocky eye hybrid. Uh, rocky eye comes in different colors, but it's, it is a hybrid name. So I've expanded that one out and this is what it says. So 20 degrees centigrade for three months or longer until a four centimeter radical appears. Then four degrees for three months, leaf appears while chilled or in the next 20 degree cycle. So this is pretty close. In fact, the way I germinate these now is I will take the seed, I will get it moist, and I'm going to use a baggy method. It sits on my desk until it germinates. It can take a month or it can take six months. It usually doesn't take a year. Then the seed makes the root, the radical, and I just leave it there and I let it get larger and larger until it's, yeah, four centimeters is about right. I like to see a couple branches on it and so on. And then I take that and I put it in the fridge and it sits in the fridge and I check it once a week because usually within two weeks it starts making the leaf. So this is one of these really weird type seeds. It makes the root in warm temperature, but will not make the leaf until it cools down. So it needs this warm, cool cycle. Once it cools down, it makes the leaf. And believe it or not, it actually makes that leaf in the fridge. I'm always amazed at how many seeds actually germinate cold. Now, once it makes the leaves, once you see the shoot, you can take it out, warm it up, hot it up, and away you go. Five years later, you'll actually have a flowering plant. There's really nothing to peonies. And pretty much all the peonies germinate the same way. So the information there is pretty accurate. And this is what it looks like. So the big black thing in the middle is the actual seed. And it's made this root, which is the white part. It's just starting to make the leaf. So the, the seed is actually attached in the middle of the root here. And the leaf now is popping out and it's, it's almost pulled itself out of this seed here. And at that point, you can pot it up. Here's another interesting one. We're going to try to germinate some erosema, which is our jack in the pulpit. And this is a really nice uh, Ontario native plant. There are a couple different species in North America. There are quite a few species in Asia, and they're all great garden plants. In the fall, they'll make their seed heads and, and they actually make berries. Then, by the way, these are poisonous. I can tell you that my squirrels and chipmunks, they don't think they're poisonous because they'll eat them if I don't put an organza bag around them. These are also toxic to people. 
They have oxalic acid in them. And some people are very sensitive to oxalic acid and it is toxic. Uh, so when you handle these, you should be careful. And some people suggest using gloves. I don't, but I'm very careful to wash my hands afterwards. Collect the seed. It is a berry. We have to clean it. And then we start our germination process. And pretty much all the air seams germinate the same way. But we don't know how to do that yet. So let's go to the website and we look up Erosema. Again, you get two pages of different species. If it's our native one, you have to know it's a triphylum. So we look up triphylum and see what we should do with this thing. Okay, we're going to sow this one at 20 degrees. Seed germinates within three months. The pulpy coat inhibits germination. Remove by soaking and rinsing in clean water for approximately seven days. Discard the water. Sow thinly. Keep dry when dormant. Leave in pots for two years. Okay, well, that's pretty clear instructions, except in this case, it's not quite correct. If you followed these instructions, I'm certain that you would get germination. So the first thing is this pulpy coat. I do believe it will stop germination. So I always wash them really well. But to be honest, I've never tested not washing them. So who knows? But I'm going to assume that that's correct. Now, this thing about soaking and rinsing for seven days, they use this a lot on this website. And for a lot of seed, that's not necessary. Uh, if you're doing different kinds of iris, for instance, it is important. And we, we go through this process of, of soaking, taking the water off, soaking some more, taking the water off. And what this does is it actually extracts one of the chemicals from the seeds that's preventing it from germinating. So with iris seeds, this can be very important. With with erysemas, I, I never do this. So I think that you can discard that step. And this highlights one of these things about germinating seeds. We really don't know how to germinate these the best way. Most seed has been germinated by someone. And if you research it online, there's somebody we will say, well, this is the procedure I used. Now that procedure works, but that does not mean it's the best procedure or the most efficient procedure. It's just one that works. And we just don't have the data to go and say, well, no, that's that's actually not a great procedure. There's a much faster way to do this. So anyways, all these erysemas germinate warm. So you take the seed, you start them off. They take anywhere from four to six weeks. And every one I've ever done has germinated. And I've probably done about 20 different species of these now. Uh, they're pretty much like clockwork. When they germinate, they start to grow pretty normal. So we're still warm here. We don't have to give them a cold treatment at all. Uh, it'll make a root, it'll make a leaf, but it's really weird. They only make one leaf. This is a seedling. It will make one leaf and then it stops growing. It doesn't do anything else. And it's quite small the first year. Then what happens is it goes underground. The leaf goes yellow and it goes underground and it does nothing for the rest of the year. So typically you germinate them in the spring. They grow for maybe six weeks and then they're done and they just sit there till the next spring. And the next spring it makes another leaf which is a little bigger than last year but it makes one leaf and then it goes underground and does that again. And until the corm that's developing underground gets large enough it doesn't make its true leaves and it doesn't really grow very much. And of course it won't flower until it gets much bigger. So this is a very slow plant. It takes about five years to flower from seed. We don't want to wait that long. So we learn to speed things up. And this is something I've been working on the last couple of years. Take the seed as soon as I collect it. So I'll collect it in the fall, germinate them in my baggie method and then put them in soil and keep them under lights. So by Christmas, they've developed the first leaf and this picture now shows them dying back. And if I pull one of these out of the ground, it looks like these on the right. So it's formed a little tuber in the bottom has very little roots, has one leaf, and it's starting to die back. It's hibernating till next year. So then what I do is I take this pot and put it in the fruit cellar for two or three months, give it an artificial winter, and then we bring it back out warm. Now this is all done in the house and so it thinks it went through a winter and it starts growing again. Well, the nice thing about this procedure is that normally it's a slow process, but we can speed it up. So normally it germinates in spring, grows for two months, goes underground, grows again for two months in the following spring, then goes underground and that goes over and over again. And maybe in five years it's large enough to flower. But if we do it this way, we can flower it in three years. I germinate in the fall, grow for two months, uh, it goes underground, then we cool it down artificially, and then we warm it up, and it thinks it's spring, grow for two months and cool it down again. And so we essentially get 
two or even a little more than two years growth in one year. And so we can speed up this whole process. One last one that I'm going to have a look at here, uh, germinating maples. And if you know the paper bark maple, it's a nice little tree, doesn't grow too large, beautiful bark. And I tried growing these guys from seed and I didn't have a lot of luck. Started doing some research and let's see what it says here. Sow at four degrees for three months, then place at 20 degrees for three months. Requires scarification. So the first sentence here is this cycling and a lot of seeds need this cool warm cycle scarification means cut it we, we want a, a mark in there so it absorbs water more easily now it goes on to describe this in a little more details as nick or rub between sheets of sandpaper requires soaking then it goes through this uh, soaking for 24 48 hours to scar the water that's not really necessary. Then it goes on to say this, any seeds that remain floating are dead. So we discard those. And this is a myth that you'll find all over the internet. The way you can tell whether a seed is viable or not is you put it in water and if it floats, they're dead, get rid of them. If it sinks, it's good seed. It, that is a myth. It just simply doesn't work. It will work with some types of seeds, but there are many seeds that will not work. You cannot do the float test on that. You get 5% germination. Okay, so that's important here. Well, at the end of the day, what this seed is, is maybe not what you think it is. So when we look at a maple seed, we have this maple key, but the seed is inside here. So this is the actual seed, the, the whitish piece in the middle. The rest of it is really the seed capsule. So one of the things we can do with maples is to take the capsule off and just deal with the seed. But the problem with many maples is that this seed isn't viable. So a lot of times when you open these keys up, or what they're called Samaras, when you open them up, this thing in the middle here is dead. And the reason there's 5% germination is that 95% of the keys these plants make are not viable seeds. So it doesn't matter what you do to them, they're not going to grow. And this is true of a number of maples. Some maples are, are like 100% viable seed and they're really easy to germinate. And others are very difficult in part because the seeds aren't viable and in part because it needs a bunch of warm, cold cycles to get the seed to germinate. Now that you understand the basics, it's time to get into the nitty gritty of actually germinating seeds. And I'll show you everything you need to know in part two of this video. And you can get to that by clicking right here. Have great success starting your seeds.